Thank you. Are you, going to say, are you going to say what you said to me just before we went on camera? It's quite a book, Barbara. Quite a book, yeah. It's quite a book. And I said, that's like when you look at a homely baby and you say, now there's a baby. He <laughs> said, that's quite a book. It's quite a book. <laughs> uh, you're you're a, a human being who's made their living using words. And, and so I imagine the title of this book is an important choice. Yes. Audition. Yes. The significance of that. Well, I felt that I had been auditioning all my life. I was auditioning as a child. Um, For what? I, well, I hate to start off on a, on a sadder note, but uh, I had a sister who was three and a half years older than I, and who at the time, uh, when she was a little girl, was called mentally retarded. Today, she might have been considered autistic or, or intellectually impaired. Uh, she started, um, kids made fun of her, they made fun of me, so I was auditioning for friends. Mm -hmm. My father was at that time a very big figure in show business. Uh, he had the greatest nightclubs in America called Lou Walters Latin Quarter. We kept moving every time he opened a new nightclub, so I was auditioning different schools. And my father made fortunes and lost fortunes. Um, I was auditioning certainly throughout my career in television. I have finally stopped auditioning, and that's why I could write this book. What, a, re what a relief. It's a very honest book. Yeah, I mean, maybe too honest, I don't know. Do you, do you feel that way after the fact? Well, some, now I hadn't read it for a while uh, because it finally got published. It was such a, you know, such a relief. But now when I look at certain things, I think, ah. Oh. Why don't you say that? <laughs> hey, when you talked about having the affair with that, with, with that politician in the States, that yeah, I got knew, all the headlines. I, knew I, I just thought, why am I? Did you know it was going to get all the headlines? No, what happened was that I had done an uh, Oprah show about 12 days before the show, and Oprah released um, only one section, which was that 31 years ago I'd had a relationship <laughs> with an African-American senator. And I had put that in because I was trying to show not just my own feelings, but that how times had changed, because if that had leaked out, it would have totally ended my career. Go back to the very beginning for us, when you, when you started to make your first bit of headway into this career. I mean, much is made about how it wasn't easy, but I, because it was a while ago, I don't think a lot of people realize how difficult it was. A lot of people were against you, including your co-hosts. Well, when I began on the Today Show, I began as a writer. Mm -hmm. I, I never thought I'd be in front of the camera. There had been 15 so-called Today Girls before me who were models and actresses and sang and, you know, really were quite uh, beautiful and wonderful. And I was put on the Today Show for 13 weeks, and I stayed on for 13 years. So my big breakthrough, I mean, it sounds like we're talking about the Middle Ages, was when I was able to write for the men, mm -hmm. not just do the girly features. And then Hugh Downs uh, was the host and put me on the air. When he left, there was a man named Frank McGee who came in. He didn't want to be doing the Today Show. He thought it was a come down. He'd been an anchor at night. He didn't want to do a program with me, with the girl. And he went to the president at that time of NBC. Now it seems, you know, impossible to believe and said she cannot come in on any of the serious interviews. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the few times when I stood up and said, you can't do this to me. So the compromise was that he could ask three questions, mm -hmm. and then I could come in for the fourth. When you wrote this book and you knew it was going to be published, there are a lot of people's names who are in here. And, yes. and, there, and did you contact people to give them a heads up? How does that work? No, because there's nobody in there. Most people are very happy to have been in there. The only one I did contact was that romance you talked about, and I did mm -hmm. write to the senator and say, look, I'm going to be writing about you, and he wrote back to me. Um, he had divorced his wife. She has since died. He's been married for 26 years. It's kind of ancient history. Mm -hmm. I should let it be, because it sounds much sexier to make it sound as if it happened <laughs> last month. But, uh, but it didn't. It did, yeah. Uh, but most of the people that I write about, uh, I think all of the people, there's, there's almost no one there that, that I'm unkind to. This is not a kiss and tell book. You're probably the only person in the world who has had Fidel Castro, Ronald Reagan, and also George Bush drive you around in their Jeep. I ha you know, I never <laughs> thought of that, but they did. Yeah, they did. Well, yeah. Now, were they, what were they, why, what's, what's with the driving a Jeep business? Okay, why, well, they... the Fidel Castro was because we did this interview, oh, I think 1978, something like that. Mm -hmm. And after I had crossed the Bay of Pigs with him on a, on a speedboat. We were the first Americans to have crossed the Bay of Pigs. Castro, you could never do this interview today. and You wouldn't get it, and well, he's a little sick, so. But anyway, um, he said, what would you like to do? And we went through the Sierra Maestra Martins, where he had been 
a guerrilla, mm -hmm. where, where he had, when he was trying to overthrow uh, the dictator, the Batista. And he drove, smoking his cigar, driving. I was holding his gun in my lap. <laughs> And hard candies in case there were children along the right. way. So that was that Jeep. What a day. Uh, what a day. To say the least. Um, Ronald Reagan, that Jeep, was about six months after the assassination attempt uh, on, on his life. Um, and he, we went to his ranch. And he drove me around in what I said then was the scroungiest Jeep, because it was a very old Jeep with this dog sitting in the back and, and bouncing around that, that ranch. And I said, this is the scroungiest Jeep I've ever seen. And he said, well, we're, we're trying to be, we're in a, we're not, we were not in a recession. He was trying to be frugal. This was too frugal. <laughs> what was the third? Uh, the th George W. Bush. Well, George W. Bush was when I went down to do the interview with him, which was just a day before he was going to be inaugurated at his ranch, which is really a ranch yet. It's not much of a ranch. It's also his newly acquired ranch. Yeah, right? it's his newly acquired, yeah. yeah. And, and he had, uh, uh, you know, a little fish in a, in a fake fish, you know, in front of, <laughs> well, it wasn't fake, you know, it was man-made, yeah. and, and we drove, and we went through a waterfall that was this big, and so <laughs> <laughs> but to him, it's a ranch. Yeah. I'm not going to argue. I you think, know. Uh, no, you want a many, ranch? Have a ranch. Not many you know. people would be surprised that that was kind of a facade. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, who was the worst driver? I think Fidel Castro. I mean, I wasn't comparing because he's driving and smoking and talking and looking and, you know. Neither I mean, Bush nor Reagan offered you a gun while you were in the car? No. <laughs> How do you like that? That's just and, and nor did they offer me hard candies. No but candy. I had never thought that these were three people who had taken me on their Jeep. Gee. Wow. 1970, you wrote that book, How to Talk to, you know, Practically Anybody, uh, practically, uh, Anything. You know, how to Talk to Practically Anybody About Practically, practically Anything. anything. Yeah. Yeah. In that book, you had a bunch of conversation starters, guaranteed oh, yeah. comments. I'm not going to ask you your conversations, or, although maybe I will ask you one of them. <laughs> if the world was ending at midnight tonight, yep. who would you want to spend your last day with? My and daughter. it can't be family. My daughter. Oh, oh family is easy, Barbara. Uh, no, but, but. If the world is, 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 who would I want to spend my last day with? Mm -hmm. Oh. The senator. Who did you say? The senator. <laughs> Oh, how funny. No. <laughs> no, I don't know. Maybe the Dalai Lama. Who your last interview? Who would you like to be your last interview? Osama bin Laden. Yeah. What if Osama bin Laden was why the world was ending at midnight? <laughs> I think I could manage that. <laughs> I have said that. Yeah. Get any more big gets. Yeah. But if Osama bin Laden called, I'd pack. The, uh, the O.J. Simpson thing, you turned O.J. Simpson down? We had because O.J. Simpson always had conditions. He either wanted to plug his book or he wanted money. And, uh, and then I was asked if I wanted to do the interview with him with, with the book that was called If I Did It, mm -hmm. because the, uh, the people who were doing it said uh, you could get him to confess. And, and I didn't think I could get him to confess. And, and I, they said, if we get huge ratings, and I said, maybe, but I don't want to do it. And I turned it down. Thanks yeah. for coming on. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed it.